In 2022, state lawmakers and Governor Kathy Hochul approved a new law designed to pave the way for thousands of apartments under the purview of the New York City Housing Authority to gain access to much-needed capital improvement dollars. For an update on the implementation of that law, we're checking in with Isaiah Thompson, a senior policy analyst at the Community Service Society of New York, where he researches and advocates for housing policies designed to improve the lives of low-income New Yorkers and foster stronger urban communities. Welcome to the Capitol Press Room, Isaiah. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for having me. So the bill signed into law created the new Public Housing Preservation Trust. What is the goal of this trust? So the Preservation Trust essentially is a mechanism for finding funding for the repairs needed at, in NYCHA. When we, when we look at the sort of broader context of, of NYCHA housing, public housing has really had a decline in funding, in federal funding, for four decades now. And because of that, we've had you know, lower amounts that NYCHA's had to do capital repairs, um, lower amounts for operations funding, and it's, it's led to a lot of disrepair in the public housing stock. So with, with the Preservation Trust, this is a last-ditch effort to really try and preserve and save what amounts to really the, the size of a, of a big city in, the, in America, um, NYCHA, and try and preserve some of these, all of these units, um, hopefully. And so the Preservation Trust is sort of an, an idea that the brainchild of NYCHA to, to do that while maintaining public control of the, the stock. Well, how does the trust go about raising money? Is it going to be having a bake sale for housing costs? Does it go out and try to bond large amounts of money? What is the fundraising mechanism? So there, there are a lot of rules that sort of tie NYCHA's hands when it comes to financing. Um, they have to follow certain rules when it comes to the bidding process to make repairs. They only can use a Section 9 funding, which is a, a federal program which provides rent, rent um, assistance, but a very low amount. So but the idea is essentially to transfer units to the Section 8 program, specifically using tenant protection vouchers. These vouchers have a, are worth a lot more than what the Section 9 subsidy is. Um, if I'm thinking of a four-person household with an uh, income of 40000 say, two-bedroom, you would get about $470 of subsidy from the Section 9 program. A similar unit for with the TPVs would be you know, upwards of $690. And, and a TPV is? The tenant protection voucher. So, the, but the the problem is the only way to access the tenant protection vouchers would be to transfer the units to something a different entity. NYCHA can't use them on their own. So, in a weird way, the, the trust is just sort of giving the units to another public agency that is partially controlled by NYCHA, so that they can take advantage of this federal program. Um, and, and the added portion of this is that. NYCHA, the trust will then bond out the, the TPVs, bring them together, bond them out, and raise some capital that way. So you're essentially just getting a loan. Um, and I think there's, there's been a lot of consternation over the fact that they're using bonds, but I think one of the things that we've been trying to point to is that you know, NYCHA was initially, originally funded via bonding. It was built using bond financing, you know, airports, school construction, all, all things that use bond financing. And that's really what's going to help raise a lot of the or a lot of the capital to fix these units, in addition to the added subsidy that TPVs bring in. Well, the governor signed the legislation into law back in June of 2022. So as we talk in early March, how is the implementation of the measure going? I think it's it's been a bit um, a rough, of a rough start. I think it was always it's always a very very hard thing to do when you're completely changing what's creating a brand new program and a brand new management structure that's never existed before. And I think the added difficulty has been that for the first time, I think in the, probably you could say the history of this country, residents get to vote on what happens to their developments. You know, nothing like this has ever happened with public housing yet. So NYCHA is, has a long way to go to really sell the program and sell the, the, what the trust to the tenants themselves. And I think they're beginning that process, but there still are some things to figure out, specifically who's going to actually run the voting process. I think they probably had a bit of trouble trying to figure out who can actually run 
an election of, of the size that some of these developments will be. There's not a lot of organizations and companies set up to do local elections, but I know they're still in the process of figuring that out. Ensuring that the protections are the same when units cross over to the trust is really important. I think there's some details in there that, that have to be figured out still. What we know so far is that NYCHA is shooting for late spring, so maybe May, to give out the first notice and tell us what developments are going to actually be voting for the trust. They put out voting rules in December, and and part of those rules are that there has to be at least 100 days from the notice before an election actually happens. So that would mean probably may see the first votes happen in September. And do you need the tenants to sign off on the trust in order for it to begin its work and to try to generate funds? In December, the voting rules came out, and they sort of specified exactly how it has to go down. You can go over a few of the important rules, you know, 18 and over, everyone 18 and older gets a vote. There is a threshold, so 20% of the heads of households, so that's the people on the lease, have to vote in order for the vote to actually be valid. Okay. Um, I guess an example, if we're looking at like Marcy houses in, in, in Brooklyn, which has a lot of capital needs, so hopefully they can get repairs soon. They have 1,711 units, just about. Um, so something like two, 343 heads of households would have to vote for the vote to even count. If you don't reach that 20% threshold, the whole election is invalid and just doesn't count. NYCHA would then have to either try again and try again for another vote or move on, essentially. Some of the other rules uh, that may be important is uh, NYCHA is going to try and do this in clusters. So they're probably in late spring will mention a number of developments that are going to be voting. They have to use a third party to run the election and the vote will happen over 30 days. For 30 days, people will be able to either send in a mail-in ballot or go online. And in the last 10 days of that 30-day period, they'll be able to vote in person. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very, very, very loud and um, sort of crazy process. But I mean, that's democracy, I guess. Well, for listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're talking with Isaiah Thompson, a senior policy analyst at the Community Service Society of New York. Well, let's fast forward to this spring and assume uh, the vote is successful and tenants decide they'd like to have the trust. What would the next steps be and what would the timeline for future action be? As I was saying earlier, there are still some things to set up as far as the trust. The trust has to get a board a trust has to hire people to, to start to start actually doing the, the work. Um, and another important thing is the, uh, the bonds themselves. We luckily have had a federal government that, while Build Back Better failed and didn't give us all the money that we thought we could get for housing, which would have been historic, but they have increased the tenant protection vouchers, which are the vouchers that will be used by the trust and used in the bonds. So um, this year, for the first time ever, tenant protection vouchers have increased the funding to um, $337 million. That's um, tripling what we've had in 2022 and almost quadrupling uh, the years before that. Never had such high voucher amounts. So it does seem like we are going to have the vouchers necessary to actually take on the 25,000 units that we want to, that NYCHA wants to convert. Um, Whether or not enough vouchers actually come to New York is a question, so there's still a lot of advocacy to be done on that part. But the hope would be that you, we receive our vouchers, tenants go through the process, and then I think the dem- democracy and the democratic process still goes through. I think they're going to have the companies that are going to work on the project come in and, and present to the to the tenants. Um, tenants are going to get to see, you know, what kind of change is going to happen. They're going to get to vote on exactly how that happens. And I think really just voting and getting into having the ability to transfer the trust is just the beginning. It's going to be a long process of really letting tenants take the driver's seat and figure out what's going to happen to their developments, their homes, really. The real worry that we're having right now is that, um, you know, we have to get to that point because time is really ticking when it comes to some of these repairs. Buildings are in disrepair. And I mean, it's come to a point where the repairs needed are so great that they, it seems like it's going to cost less just to knock down the building and rebuild it than it would be just to repair it. 
NYCHA seems to think that's so, the development team seems to think that's so, and I think tenants are even um, willing to say, yeah, enough is enough, I'm sick of these conditions, knock it down and rebuild it. So we're on a ticking clock when it comes to a lot of these developments, so the quicker we get through this, the, the more homes are preserved. And how many homes are we talking about here? Because in the top, I mentioned thousands, but what is the actual number that could theoretically benefit? And how does that compare to the entire scope of NYCHA housing? The legislation only allows for the 25,000 units. I think that NYCHA hopes that this process will go through and, you know, they'll have two rounds of trust votes and they'll go through and it'll be a good process and people will be happy with, with the way things are moving. I think they're hoping to to try and increase that. Ultimately, there are about 100,000 more that won't be covered in the trust. There is a few thousand to, um, I guess it's 10,000 or so repairs, repair and um, modifications happening right now outside of the trust through um, some money that came from the city funding and state, city and state funding. But there are thousands of units that aren't even in the picture right now when it comes to getting repairs done. And I think those those actually should not be forgotten in this. Even at the best case scenario, we're talking, you know, three years out to where we can even have a conversation about expanding from the 25,000. And by that time, I think we'll really be worried about the condition of some of the units. So I think this does not answer all of our problems. Um, I think there still is the continued ask for the state to provide funding just to repair regular Section 9 units, whether or not we can convert them. And still the ask from the federal government to remember that it has a responsibility to actually house low-income people because it seems to have abdicated that responsibility for, for way too long. So it's possible then if the trust model is successful and state and federal officials don't step up in a meaningful way, that other housing units represented by NYCHA might try to adopt the trust model as well? Yeah, I think they, they would have to be go back to the state for um, a new bill to allow for, for more um, conversions. But alongside the trust, there's a big push for the RAD or the, the rental assistance demonstration, which also doesn't require a vote, but they have been included in the vote for the trust. It's a hard time believing that NYCHA will convert units without this voting process at this point. I think once residents realize that they have the ability to vote, that they'll want to vote without, you know, just being thrown through a conversion process. And the RAD process is so much different than the trust. Um, There's a private management organization. I've been to some, some buildings and talked to some tenants, and some of them are happy with their repairs, but some are not. And it's really hard to tell what the takeaway has been from a resident standpoint, despite the fact that it's brought in you know, millions and millions of dollars. The reality is that it will take it will take the the state the state government to to change the law and to allow for more uses. And you also we do have to continue to worry about making sure that the tenant protection vouchers are there from the federal government to actually make the conversions. So there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of units that are, you know, time is ticking. Well, we've been speaking with Isaiah Thompson. He's a senior policy analyst at the Community Service Society of New York. Isaiah, thank you so much for making the time and explaining this issue to us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.